of Music Recital Hall at Santa Clara University. Please take a moment to turn off and put away your cell phone. In the event of an emergency, you'll want to know the closest exits. Please take a moment to locate them now. Thank you. Good morning again. Good morning. In case you don't remember me or met me last night in February of Thrones from Santa Clara, so welcome again for those who didn't make it last night. There's going to be a video of the keynote, so once that link is up, uh, if you're interested, uh, we'll send it along. Uh, a reminder that uh, Ulysses is team, uh, USP, created an app, so on both iPhone and Android you can download the app called Guidebook, and within Guidebook search for PBL 2018, and you'll have all the conference information on your phone or tablet. Then on your bags there's also a map labeled food options. It's a holiday weekend here in the United States. Maybe the last time that we celebrate the presidents. <laughs> and um, and uh, in that map, it's just a few suggestions. It, because it's the holiday, very few events on campus are open, but the Student Center in Benson, which is only a five minute walk, um, has some uh, food options open, uh, like in the Mexican Grill, uh, an omelette station, and some salads will be there. And then just across the street on Lafayette, there are uh, Togo's sandwiches, uh, Hungry Ham for hamburgers, and just around the corner of that little shopping center are Vietnamese um, sandwiches and smoothies. Um, five day entrance. Uh, there's a Starbucks uh, sub hub which has big sandwiches for those of you who get very hungry, and also a bagel. Yes. Um, so with that, oh, I'm sorry. And then for those of you who still have not registered, the registration is set up in Barry Hall, where some of the sessions will be. And right after this keynote, the coffee break will be at Barry Hall, so you can do both have coffee and breaks. And then find where your session is going to be, either in the body or across the space in Lucas Hall. Okay? So, with that, I'm going to get out of the way and introduce Glenn O'Brady from Australia National University, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, it's my great pleasure this morning to be able to introduce Professor Hank Schmidt. Um, if you don't know Hank, I would recommend you reading his bio in the, in the booklet. Um, as uh, extensive and well written as this, this bio is, it really only scratched the surface, surface of uh, Hank's accomplishments. Um, in fact, I would uh, go as far as to say that uh, we're meeting here today in a PBL conference because of his scholarly work. Um, in, 2000, in the Journal of Medical Education, um, Hank and uh, one of his colleagues, Jeff Norman, wrote uh, a response to some of the hasty criticisms that were levelled at PBL. And it would, wouldn't be the only time that Hank has uh, responded to criticisms that have been levelled at PBL. If I can just quote what he wrote. Uh, we believe that the field will advance only by a systematic research program which encompasses all aspects from theory building and testing conducted with rigorous experimental designs and highly controlled and artificial settings to program evaluations in realistic settings with a deliberate attempt to capture all possible variables and interactions. Close quote. I think Hank has dedicated his life to this advancement. Much of what we know um, about PBL today has been examined, measured, analysed and explained in Hank's scholarly work. In fact, the, the longevity of PBL is in no small part due to its untiring enthusiasm and scholarly excellence in PBL. Now, some might feel I'm exaggerating, which can sometimes be the case in these introductions to keynotes. But those of you who know Hank will know that his scholarly capacity is only exceeded by his enormous generosity in helping so many others from all corners of the world, including myself, to learn the skills necessary to contribute to the understanding, practice and progress of PBL. 
Somebody once said the values we live by are worth more than are worth more when we pass them on. And so it is with him. It is staggering to think of the exponential effect that Hank has had on his students, his colleagues, and each of us as we build upon the work that he and the other giants in PBL have done and continue to do. I've now lost count how many times I have heard Hank speak, but it's a testament to his generosity to pay it forward so that our students would benefit from what we know about PBL. Colleagues, can you join with me in welcoming Professor Hugh? Now, problem-based learning, 
the oldest of the forms of active learning to distinguish itself from other forms of active learning in a number of ways. For instance, if you look at uh, the flipped classroom, also an active learning uh, approach uh, involving uh, students who work together in small groups, uh, the problem doesn't come first, because in the flipped classroom, the learning resources come first. Students study on, them, on their own, and then come to class and work together on uh, problems. Same applies to team-based learning, also a very interesting new uh, uh, new uh, uh, aspect of, of active learning. Uh, again, there the learning resources come first, and then uh, students work on uh, problems together in small uh, uh, groups. Project-based learning looks most like problem-based learning, or problem-based learning looks most like project-based learning because then the problem also comes first. Uh, but the problem in problem-based learning is always designed by a teacher. Whereas in project-based learning, the problem might be formulated by students themselves. And, and, and then the, the learning cycle in project-based learning is, tends to be much longer than in problem-based learning, where you have the learning cycles from one to three days. In fact, uh, Glenn, uh, who was here a few minutes ago, was one of the founding members of a, in my view, revolutionary polytechnic in Singapore, which uh, had an approach called One Day, One Problem. And so uh, his program started every morning with a new problem on which the students would work all day. Okay, so this is what I'm going to talk about when I talk about problem based learning. Now let's go back to the uh, past and look, let's look at what was uh, promised uh, that problem based learning uh, would do to students. Now, according to the early literature, problem-based learning would contribute to a more student-centered, friendly learning environment. Students acquiring better interpersonal and other relevant professional skills. It would help students in the acquisition and retention of relevant knowledge. And uh, students, uh, some say, would acquire better thinking skills for reasoning skills, uh, critical thinking skills, inquiring, uh, and finally students would acquire self-directed and long, lifelong learning skills. So this is a very attractive list. Right? It sounds like a solution for all the problems in uh, education. <laughs> but did it provide this? I'm, I'm going to talk about a number of studies, and these studies are curriculum comparison studies. So these are attempts to compare programs, conventional programs, problem-based uh, programs, uh, uh, concerning the program as a whole. Uh, there are a lot of experimental studies. Uh, my colleague uh, Diana Goldmans uh, uh, has done uh, uh, quite a number of them, and, and uh, other colleagues at Maastricht uh, University and elsewhere as well. But I'm going to concentrate on the curriculum comparison studies because they were very popular. Everybody wants to know, you know, what is better? Does problem-based learning really lead to all these desired characteristics that I just mentioned? But with curriculum comparison studies, there is, there are difficulties. Difficulties in inter interpreting curriculum comparisons. So for instance, there's no random assignment of students to the conditions of the experiment. And so it might be possible that the students who go to a conventional school are quite different from those who go to the problem-based school. There is absence of double-blind experimenting. Everybody knows where he is. Students who are in a problem-based curriculum know that they are in a problem-based curriculum and that it is to some extent an experimental curriculum. And then, uh, more importantly, the nature of the treatment varies over size. You know, problem-based learning is a, a, uh, a concept that is understood in quite different ways in different uh, uh, areas of the world, in different schools. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, can you compare uh, problem-based with a conventional curriculum when the problem-based curriculum is not really a problem-based curriculum, but for instance a hybrid curriculum with lots of lectures, etc. And then, even if you find differences, what is really the critical in, uh, in ingredient uh, uh, here? What is, what, what does the work? So these are
these are some of the difficulties that we are going to ignore in the rest of the story. Uh, <laughs> Um, and and I, I also have some somewhat better news because uh, there is uh, in the Netherlands there was a unique situation until recently that uh, students could be assigned to a medical school rather than choose a medical school. Uh, of the 8,000 students, only uh, 3,000 uh, would uh, uh, get in, and uh, what was used was a lottery procedure. Because by that time it was thought that uh, everybody who uh, was admissible uh, could have a chance and uh, only a lottery could help uh, doing this in a, in a, in a, in a fair way. And uh, this lottery procedure, whatever you think of it, led to eight medical schools that in terms of their schools were largely uh, comparable. Uh, I, I, I once computed the, uh, the mean GPA uh, when these students would come in, and in fact, the differences between these eight schools were less than you know, uh, three hundredths of uh, a score of the GPA. And so these school schools were really very much alike in all kinds of, uh, these students were very much alike in, in all kinds of respects. So, uh, part of my talk is about this natural experiment, these natural experiments that were carried out in the Netherlands. Now let's go to the first issue that I mentioned, does PBL provide a more, more student-centered uh, learning environment? According to most studies, it does. There is, for instance, uh, a study by Kunig and Schauenberg, uh, and uh, they uh, compared the conventional and problem-based curriculum in Germany, and uh, students report less stress, fewer feelings of being powerless, and less fatalism in the uh, uh, a problem-based uh, 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 curriculum. Students feel more supported by the learning environment and experience more social support. There is less depression among students in a problem-based school. And in Dutch nationwide surveys, a kind of consumer <coughs> report type of research, uh, among students, problem-based curricula always finish first in that category. There are presently Three out of eight medical schools in the Netherlands uh, that call themselves problem-based, and they always are uh, chosen by the students as the best schools that you can go to. Now I have to make a short interlude uh, with regard to uh, important, potentially important uh, uh, professional competencies of university graduates. Uh, you could say in general, what we train our students for is that they are very productive. They get much work done, productivity, efficiency, effectiveness. That's what you expect from a university graduate, from a college graduate. Uh, and you also expect them to getting the work done with the help of others. Teamwork, leadership skills. These seems to be, these seems to be also, also quite important. And then uh, getting the work done in a new, innovative way. Creativity, problem solving is, is our desirable characteristics in our graduates. And then, of course, uh, not the least important, getting work done using science. Finding, reviewing, producing, disseminating scientific knowledge. Um, does PBL help students acquire such, such more general professional competencies? All studies point in same direction, yes. Uh, in particular, the communication skills uh, developed in problem-based uh, students from a problem-based curriculum are much uh, better, uh, as studies uh, show. For instance, there is an old study by Woodward and Pauli, uh, where supervisor ratings were used, and students from McMaster University were considered far more relaxed in their relationships with the uh, patients, were better listeners uh, and were uh, better able to work with patients to get the best results. Uh, there is also a study by Van Dalen uh, where students from different universities work with simulated patients and these, uh, 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 these, these talks with these simulated patients were videotaped and then blind uh, rated by observers, and uh, uh, Van Dalen found 
that indeed students from, in this case, the Master School, were doing much better in terms of their uh, uh, communicating with uh, the patients. I myself did a study uh, using self ratings, um, and I, I show you a little bit about that uh, in, in a minute. And then there is a review written by Chun Huat Ho uh, of 13 uh, studies where comparisons were made with regard to these professional skills, and they found that in most of these areas that I mentioned, uh, the differences favored the problem based uh, schools. You know, um, I left uh, Maastricht University around uh, 2000, but before that, the, the school uh, was 25 years old, um, and I uh, joined uh, Erasmus University, and I, when I was there, it turned out that they also had an anniversary. And, uh, you know, as a researcher, you take, you take the opportunity because anniversaries uh, means there's money available. <laughs> and, um, so I convinced the university board to give me money to send a questionnaire to all the graduates of Maastricht, the University Medical School, and all the graduates of Erasmus University Medical School, uh, asking them to rate themselves uh, based on a number of these uh, uh, professional uh, qualities. Uh, let me show you how I did this. Of course, what, what, what you should want to is uh, send observers to all of these graduates and then uh, have them uh, observe for several days and, 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 and rate it, uh, and then bring the ratings together. But you cannot do that, of course. You have to use the observer who is on the spot, which is the graduate himself. Yeah? That's the only way you can do it. So the research that I'm going to show you has all kinds of uh, uh, limitations. Uh, but leads to some interesting uh, results. This is, this is the, the, the basic question that I asked uh, these graduates, uh, these 1,400 graduates of the two medical schools. How good are you compared to colleagues from other universities in communication skills? And then students, the, these graduates have to rate themselves as much more, equally good, uh, much better. Now, of course, you know, if, if, if you should take the group as a whole, the mean score should be free. Uh, some uh, are better, some are poor, but the mean schools, uh, scores should, should be free. Uh, what, what you see is what people do when they respond to this, these kinds of questions is they overestimate themselves a little bit. And they underestimate uh, the colleagues a little bit. Because they observe themselves quite often, and they do not observe their colleagues that, uh, that often. And in fact, it's, it's a sign of lack of compression if you consider yourself, on the whole, a little bit better than the rest. Uh, can you imagine if you say, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm much poorer than my colleagues. And maybe it's time to go to a psychiatrist. <laughs> and so, so there is a, 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 an element of, of self-emergrisement, uh, 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 self-overestimation, and in fact uh, you can see it in, in the data that I, uh, that I uh, collected. So I uh, asked them to rate themselves in 19 professional competencies and I've summarized them uh, here for you. Um, this is the first one. Uh, so we had the Maastricht PDL curriculum and the Rotterdam Con Convention curriculum. And this is the interpersonal competency area, communication skills, leadership skills, collaboration skills. And you see there is a clear difference um, uh, between the two schools. In fact, here at point 24 is the self-overestimation uh, measure. Uh, and they consider themselves a little bit better than the rest of the Netherlands. Uh, and and uh, so this is the measure of, of, of overestimation. Now you see that PBL students uh, see themselves as far more communicative as, as having better interpersonal uh, competencies. Um, to, to show you a, a contrast, here it is uh, the response to the question whether they see themselves as better in terms of medical knowledge. And you see, uh, the students see themselves as a little bit poorer in medical knowledge than the students from uh, Rotterdam, which 
It is in line with other studies uh, showing the same phenomena. We will talk about these uh, other studies as well, but it, it, it indicates that this approach has some validity, because if there would be a hollow effect, that is that Maastricht students, because they were part of this experiment, you know, consider themselves better all the way than you would have expected uh, here a difference as well. Now, problem solving and self-regulation competencies, also a, a, a big, uh, a rather big difference. Uh, but with regard to task supporting competencies, such as productivity and efficiency, uh, the difference is, is can be ignored uh, a lot. So, it seems that these, these general professional competencies, uh, on the whole, uh, are better taken care of in problem-based curriculum. And, uh, and that is something to be uh, glad about. But, now we... You know, I personally, uh, from the time that I started in 1974, I had the idea that problem-based learning, because in so many ways it, um, it applies ideas from constructivist cognitive psychology, it should also lead, lead to deeper learning, to more knowledge, to better retention. And the reality is that in most of these curriculum comparison studies, uh, these differences cannot be found. Um, an important approach to this problem is the uh, approach uh, taken by uh, Case von der Vleuten uh, and his colleagues, also uh, at Maastricht University. Uh, he and his colleagues developed already very early a test which they call a progress test. This is essentially a test uh, consisting of 150 to 250 multiple choice items uh, that students uh, uh, have to do four times a year. So this test in new versions all the time is administered four times a year and in all years. Uh, and the idea is, is generally that students should show progress over time. And if they don't, it, it would mean that they have to redo a year or even uh, have to drop out. And you see here uh, some of these uh, findings. This is a, uh, a test uh, uh, taken in 2003, but not only by Maastricht students, but also by students from three other universities. And you should realize these are all students. This, these are not samples, these are populations of students that take uh, the test. And in this test in March 2003, there were small differences favoring um, Groningen and uh, uh, Maastricht, but in later years, these differences disappeared. And this leads to the conclusion in the literature that whatever problem-based learning does, it does not help you acquire deeper, better, more applicable uh, knowledge. Um, and in fact, it forms the basis of a lot of criticism uh, voiced in the early 2000s. Uh, you promised us better students, but you do not uh, bring them. Because their knowledge is comparable with what conventional education uh, does. And, and for me personally, this was the more problematic because uh, my colleagues and I, uh, Diana Dormans, uh, uh, lots of other people, we have done experimental research at the micro level. So we would prevent, uh, present uh, half of the students with a, uh, a relevant problem, the other half did something else, then we would give both of the groups the same text relevant to the problem for the same amount of time and then we would test this. And what we found was that the problem before the text facilitated the understanding of the text in a tremendous way. Large differences favoring the problem-based uh, learning. Let me show you a uh, recent study by uh, Sophie Lloyds. What she studied uh, was the effect
effect of PBL on conceptual understanding and um, uh, the, 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 the text that students had to study was a text on uh, New Newtonian mechanics. Uh, and uh, the, the problem is that she had three groups. Uh, a group that uh, discussed a number of problems of the type that you saw before. You know, there's, there's a plane and uh, this is Holland in 1944 and uh, 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 rats are, are thrown out of uh, planes to uh, help the people uh, survive uh, in, in, uh, in Holland. And then the question is always, you know, what, what trajectory does the red uh, fall uh, to the ground? Is it, uh, go, does it go this way, does it go this way, or does it go that way? Yeah? <coughs> Typically these kinds of, of, of problems she presented to uh, small groups of students, and students had to discuss these problems. Then they received a text on uh, Newtonian mechanics, and uh, they uh, were uh, tested immediately after the uh, experiment and, and a week uh, later. And there were two control groups. One uh, group simply uh, read the text uh, for the same amount of time that the other group uh, worked on the problem and, 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 and read the text. And there was a, a group that received a lecture on the topic. And in both the text and the uh, lecture, uh, the problems were involved, so the problems were there. They, they essentially got the same type of information. What you see here is this. there was a pretest, there were no differences between the three groups. But then, directly after reading the text, there's a large difference uh, favoring problem based uh, uh, learning group, and, and this effect remains after a week. In fact, there is no loss of knowledge uh, in that uh, week, and in fact, that is something that in other studies was also found. No loss of knowledge, uh, full retention of, of knowledge over the period of a week or a, a month. So you can imagine my disappointment uh, and also my surprise that you could not find the same phenomena at the curriculum level. Now, um, there is something problematic with these curriculum level studies. As I already said, uh, there is something problematic. Maybe these groups are not comparable, although these studies by Van der Vleuten and all were taken in the Dutch situation where this natural experiment was going on. Uh, but nevertheless, there is something fishy with these studies. And I, uh, my explanation is that these curricular comparisons ignore drop out. Imagine a treatment, uh, a, a drug that is given for six years uh, to patients. And uh, there is a drug uh, called PBL and there is a drug called conventional. <laughs> the people have to take it you know, and, uh, for six years and, and in the end their health is measured. Yeah. And you find no difference. Now the conclusion would be these two drugs do the same thing. But now I tell you that in the conventional drug uh, group, 30% of the patients have died. <laughs> Whereas in the problem-based drug group, uh, only 10% have died. Now what would you conclude? You know, despite of the fact that the health of the survivors is the same, the drug called public based learning must have been better for them because it helps more people survive. And um, that led me to, also in response to all these negative papers that appeared in educational psychologists, the failure of problem based inquiry, uh, project based uh, uh, learning. In response to that, I look back at all the studies that have been done. Uh, at Maastricht University using this uh, progress test. Because in the Netherlands, we also have very detailed information about dropout rates of the different universities. And my thinking was that you could uh, uh, correct the scores of students using the dropout rate by equalizing the number of dropouts in all these groups so that they cannot 
explain differences anymore. And I wrote a paper, Constructivist Problem-Based Learning Does Work. <laughs> uh, Meta-analysis curriculum for parents in a single medical school. Uh, it was published in 2009 in the Educational Psychologist. Now, uh, first I, I used the, uh, I, uh, the comparison now always using uh, Cohen's, Cohen's uh, G, G is, means nothing else than difference, where uh, the mean scores of the two groups are compared and divided by the standard deviation and the standard deviation as a complex uh, form, uh, but uh, nothing special. Um, and uh, let me show you first the data from the 2009 uh, study in which I did not yet uh, deal with the uh, dropout uh, rates. Now, what you see here is this. There were 100, and then, now you can see that, you know, during 50 years, lots of comparisons have been done in the Netherlands. There were, I found, 110 comparisons um, involving seven out of eight medical schools uh, on knowledge, 24 on diagnostic reasoning, communication skills, medical skills, judgment of the quality uh, of the other. Uh, <coughs> now what you see here, this is the D indicating the difference between the groups. And you can see it favors a little bit uh, the uh, problem-based school, but, but you know, the effect is so small that you can say there's really no difference, which is what most other studies find. In diagnostic reasoning, the difference is a little bit larger, larger uh, and, and you see that in particular in communication skills and medical skills, uh, the effects are much uh, higher. I ignore the, the rest for now. Now, so this was the first conclusion. Indeed, if you take these data on face value, then there are no differences in knowledge. Uh, but then I found in the literature and, and, and uh, attending conferences like these that there were quite a number of studies showing that problem based learning protects against dropout. Uh, here you see the attrition rates in subsequent Harvard dental curriculum. Uh, this was the, the uh, baseline. They lost about uh, 27 percent of their students enrolling. And then they introduced PBL and basic sciences in this dental curriculum. And then the dropout rate went down from 27 to 17 percent. And then they changed their curriculum in a full uh, PBL curriculum. The dropout rate even uh, went down. Um, similar effects uh, can be seen in, uh, this, is, uh, this is a little bit of a Pity uh, can be seen in the Netherlands because there are three medical schools: Maastricht, Groningen since 1993, and Nijmegen since 1995. And I have uh, summarized the dropout rates uh, over a period of 10 years, and these three schools show uh, uh, higher graduation rates, so lower dropout rates than the other five. Uh, medical schools. And the same applies to study duration. And you can see here a little bit better that these schools uh, uh, graduate students much sooner than the other five schools, so they are more efficient. Now, now, now comes the, the difficult uh, part. Now I'm going to show you what happens to mean scores on a test when dropout uh, is taken into account. Yeah. So you have to bear with me. This is a little bit technical. Let's, let's assume that we have uh, two treatments in two medical schools, and these loops are comparable. And what you see here are the scores on the final examination. The, the, the schools are examination free. There's only an end of uh, school evaluation, and, and that decides on whether you can go for further training or have to drop out. Uh, in the Netherlands, we use a 10-point scale. And uh, 6 means sufficient. But if you have a 6, you can continue. If you have a 5 or lower, uh, you failed this examination. Yeah. And what you 
you see here is that uh, treatment A, uh, and uh, let's call it uh, the PDL treatment, and let's call this the conventional treatment, uh, uh, they, they differ significantly from each other. And so I, I, I have developed these data myself, and uh, these are not actual data. I, this is a simulation. You can see that the difference is, uh, difference is statistically significant. If you take the full schools, all the students, but in reality, what happens is that those students who fail the examination have to leave and are not part of the experiment anymore. It's like the dead people in the drugs uh, comparison. Yeah. And you see only the six and higher uh, remain. Uh, and if you look now at the mean scores, there's no difference anymore. <laughs> yeah? There's no difference anymore. But in this case, the dropout is 19 percent, and in that case, the dropout is 30 percent. So what dropout does, it, it hides differences between schools. Yeah. And so, therefore, with the help of, of a number of colleagues, uh, uh, from Maastricht, but also involving Jeff uh, Norman, uh, I, I reanalyzed my data taking into account the differences in dropout and study duration. And I wrote a paper in academic medicine called Differential Student Attrition dropout, and Differential Exposure Masks Effect, Masks Effect of Home Based Learning in Curriculum Comparison Studies. And now if you look at, at the new data, <coughs> uh, uh, this, this were the original ones, that small differences favoring the problem based curriculum in terms of medical knowledge and diagnostic reasoning. But if you correct for uh, dropout, the effects become medium. And if you uh, 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 correct for uh, dropout and study duration differences, then the effects become medium to large. So a fair comparison means that you have to take into account these biases. And the whole literature on curriculum comparison ignores these biases. But what happened was that since these papers appeared in academic medicine and educational psychology, it uh, was not good for the name of the based learning. Because eventually people say, you see, it, it, it doesn't make a difference. And when I wrote this paper, I was too late. <laughs> you, know, you can look at the citations of the paper and you see, you know, ask, no. Nobody ever reads it anymore. Uh, simply because, you know, the time has passed in a way. This is the general idea, and now it's very difficult to uh, change the, uh, the perspective of, of, of problem based learning uh, on, on these issues. And so these are some of the uh, uh, assessment of the values of PBL. However, in 2001, there is no difference in knowledge acquired uh, uh, with students from conventional schools, so why bother using problem-based learning? Uh, so Shamley in 2007, let's leave the empty glass of PBL behind. And then uh, Kirchner, why minimal guidance during instruction does not work? An analysis of the failure of constructivist discovery, problem-based experiential and inquired degree based learning. Um, to some extent, I, I would agree with that. I would agree that minimally guidance, minimal guidance does not really help. But the problem is that that problem is learning is a highly guided type of approach. There's enormous support for students. You know, there's a tutor for each uh, eight or ten students. There is the problem that is designed by the teacher uh, very carefully. There are the resources. There is. Uh, uh, this is the group discussion that helps you elaborate on the stuff and, and takes care that you do your work uh, 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 when, when requested. Uh, so I would agree with their general assessment, but I thought that this article caused uh, problem based learning also to come under the wheels of progress, which is a pity. Now, I think this story generally is a positive story about what we are trying to do in this community. 
but there are a couple of concepts and uh, competences acquired and ascribed to problem based learning that we did not discuss. So I now have a negative message for you. What are these competences? Critical thinking skills, inquiry skills, clinical reasoning skills, problem solving skills, self directed learning skills, lifelong learning skills. So these are, let, let's describe them as general thinking skills. And, and among us, among the educational community, there is this strong belief that problem based learning must lead to better performance in these areas. That students in a problem based school, school become better critical thinkers, better political reasoners, uh, etc. Now, if you look at the empirical literature, if you look at what the material, what the what science says, what you find essentially is this. In particular, in nursing education, lots of studies on, on critical thinking with a critical thinking uh, uh, questionnaire. There's no evidence that problem-based learning helps. Inquiry skills, no evidence. Critical reasoning skills, no evidence. Problem solving skills, no evidence. Self-directed learning skills, yeah, there is one early study showing that students in a problem-based curriculum go more to the library than students in a conventional uh, program. Uh, and that's about it. And lifelong learning skills, also, there is no evidence that our students, our PBL students, uh, develop these lifelong learning skills to a larger extent than students from conventional education. And why? Why these negative findings? Why is this? Now this is really the important message that I really want to share with you. This is because thinking skills like critical thinking and problem solving, they do not exist separate from the knowledge because knowledge is the stuff needed for thinking. Yeah? So you cannot speak of problem solving skills in isolation or critical thinking skills in isolation. Uh, they are dependent on how much you know and how you know it. What your knowledge of the world is. And uh, I, I, as a witness I call upon uh, somebody who is in the audience Professor Lee Schulman, uh, who wrote a very influential book together with Arthur Elsie and Sarah Spravka. Uh, and you see, I've used it a lot. And, <laughs> and, it, it, it really, and, and my PhD students also read it, and then I, I go back and country this way. And what Professor Schulman and, and his colleagues were doing in the 70s were looking for a general problem solving skill among doctors. And because this idea was, you know, the pen doctors must be people who have superior thinking skills, <coughs> superior reasoning skills. And what they found was nothing. They didn't find anything. They found something, uh, but uh, they, found, they found one thing. Maybe the problem solving is highly content specific. Yeah? This means that dependent on the knowledge that you have, you are successful in problem solving and, uh, and diagnosing a case or, or whatever. And uh, if you don't have the knowledge, then you are not successful. And it turns out that within a group of, of doctors, there's no correlation between, uh, their, their, uh, uh, between their performance on case A uh, or B or C. Because it's all knowledge. And it's knowledge that enables them to uh, to do what they, what they are able uh, to do. And therefore, this is my final message, PBL cannot be a useful way to develop expertise in a domain if it does not foster deep knowledge acquisition. There's no easy way out. You know, in the 70s, we had this idea, and it was fostered in particular by Howard Barrows. We had this idea that if you teach students a method <coughs> Uh, of thinking, you know, they would not be, uh, be 
it would not be necessary to learn all the uh, stuff of medicine anymore. Because they could use this method to solve all these problems. And the method that Barrows always indicated was the method that was discovered by uh, Lee Schulman and Elsie namely the hypothetical deductive method. And indeed, doctors work according to the hypothetical deductive method. They see a set of signs and symptoms, and then it brings ideas, hypotheses. And then they test these hypotheses against new information from the same thing, hypothetical deductive method. But right after this book, this, I think even it's, it's in, the, in the book itself, uh, the, the colleagues discovered that students do the same thing. They do exactly the same thing. They see some signs and symptoms, they come up with an idea, and they test this idea. What is the difference between the doctors and the students? The doctors have better ideas based on the And so, if you don't, I mean, uh, I told a similar story uh, last year in Zurich, and, and it led to a, a small row, I, I must say. You know, I, I, I hardly made it to the uh, <laughs> exit. Uh, and therefore, I'm so glad that my, my senior colleague and one of the towering figures in, in, in the field of innovative uh, education, Lee Schumann uh, from Stanford University, is, is here because he can now uh, uh, discuss with you uh, what I have said, and I don't have to do that anymore. Thank you. <laughs> Um, criticisms of PDL and the uh, and the research that talks about knowledge acquisition. You said something about um, deeper knowledge, and then you started talking about multiple choice tests. Can you really measure? It? Could some of this be confounded by the assessments themselves? Yeah, you're you entirely right. Uh, but you you can imagine that if you do research like my colleagues in, in last week. Uh, uh, having to deal with 3,000, 4,000 students who answer questions about medicine as a whole. Uh, you cannot uh, avoid using multiple choice questions. Uh, for the rest, I'm, I'm entirely with you. I have my reservation with regard to uh, uh, multiple choice items because they, uh, they uh, are based on recognition Whereas, you know, what we do in everyday life is retrieval from what we know. And so the best ways of measuring what we know, what we are able to do, would be retrieval types of tests like open-ended open essay questions or problems or, or whatever. But of course, in these kinds of studies, it, it is impossible to use them. And I don't think that that fact invalidates but in my own experimental research, I always use open-ended type of, of questions because I'm interested in the retrieval uh, of students. A question over here. Uh, Mike, um, I wonder if there's another dimension to it. PBL is very much about collaborative learning. Wouldn't be collaborative testing an adequate method to retrieve information? And wouldn't that be in line with the modern working environment? Constructivist than a social constructivist, to be honest. Uh, 
Uh, I believe that, that eventually knowledge has to end up here somewhere. And uh, of course then you can work with others you know, to do great things. Uh, but you cannot escape from, uh, at least that's what I think, huh? uh, you cannot escape from the, the acquisition of knowledge by individuals, helped by groups, uh, facilitated by groups, facilitated by teachers, but you know, it has to, to end up there. Yeah. Hi, uh, I think that the, the problem with it, the kind of evidence that people know in this, this text, because you have to, with technology, it's possible to track many, many uh, uh, problems solved and project based. You have many kinds of uh, uh, tools to, to uh, make uh, uh, register, make, make it, it's possible to, to, to think about another kind of evidence because learning is not a, 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 a rat in the, the lab, not an inductive, only inductive kind of uh, research. I work with uh, data design research, you have to think about how to the, the, the knowledge is, is, is building, how to, to build this, uh, the solutions, uh, because uh, problem-based learning, you, you, you think about the real problem, and you think about this real problem, and the, the, it's a, a, a complexity for, for the solutions, and the, the evidence is not, uh, uh, it's impossible to, uh, the, the thinking the right answer in the, the first of the, 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 the beginning of the process. Then uh, I think the, the, the kind of studies for evidence, or based evidence, based evidence uh, studies, you have to change the, the methodology. How, the methodology and the kind of evidence. Because people uh, called evidence only the, the uh, 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 only the right answers. Only the uh, we we do a, a, a survey in the beginning and do a survey and, and the, uh, the final uh, steps. No problem. Yeah, I, I think that that your description of, of let's say the empirical method uh, is a little bit uh, I would not say biased, but uh, meager. Uh, there are uh, hundreds of studies, for instance, that try to track uh, learning over time. Um, there is a, a, an approach called the micro-analytical approach, where uh, students in the classroom are followed uh, every hour with measures over time, so that you can see how learning uh, changes over time. Uh, there are several studies in, in the problem-based learning field that does that. You know, uh, the, the alternative that people come up with is qualitative studies. And to be honest, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I cannot say that I'm an, an average reader, uh, but I have not yet seen studies coming out of the qualitative approach that will lead to more than what we already put in there. Uh, so, so I think we should be very uh, proud of, of this special method of knowledge acquisition that we have as scientists, namely the uh, scientific uh, method, because it contains all kinds of uh, 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 reservations against you know, the hopes and the beliefs of people that, uh, that their beloved hypothesis will come out eventually. Uh, but again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just one of the one more question over here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Kasia Weiber. I'm a psychologist and qualitative uh, researcher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I uh, study this phenomena in a totally different uh, way than you do. But uh, that is not my uh, question. I, I respect the own natural scientific approach, and uh, I cannot do it, you can do it uh, in, in your way, and it gives us some results, but 
At the beginning, you made an interesting distinction between problem-based learning, where the teacher identifies a problem, where all the, the problem is beginning, and uh, project-based learning. And project-based learning is, uh, yeah, the philosophy of all our university. And my question is, when it comes to the conclusions you conclusions you have presented here today, are they based on the problem-based learning? Uh, teaching philosophy of, of Maastricht and, and so on. And could you comment on the uh, difference uh, with respect to perhaps the problem-based learning and philosophy? Project based learning. Um, you should realize that my uh, discussion about problem-based learning uh, does say anything, doesn't say anything about other forms of active learning. I think that project-based learning <laughs> in particular in the final stages of a curriculum, is a, an excellent way to bring in authenticity uh, into the curriculum, to uh, provide students with responsibility to, to solve a pressing societal problem. Uh, I like it. I, I love it. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, project-based education has developed at Harvard University was one of the sources uh, for problem-based learning. Uh, the problem is unique in the sense that it assumes that your existing knowledge base is a good starting point for learning. Uh, therefore, it can be used from year one in, in, in a curriculum more easily than project-based learning. Uh, but again, project-based learning is, is, is a very, very interesting uh, method. It should be studied more. Because if you look at the studies on the effects or whatever, uh, these studies are, are quite uh, meager. What I love for is in team-based learning uh, is the extensive uh, uh, application of what is learned. In problem-based learning, application of what is learned is very limited. You have a problem, you read the uh, materials, then you come back and you talk about the problem once again. That is the application period. But in uh, team-based learning, there's a lot of application. There's a, 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 an IRA, there's a, a TRAPS, there is, and then there are lots of application problems in which what you have learned that can be applied and, 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 and reapplied. And consolidation of knowledge and reconsolidation of knowledge is very much dependent on how many times you activate whatever you have learned in order to apply it. So that is the strength of team based learning, uh, clearly, as it is the strength of the flipped classroom where essentially the same thing happens. And so each of these methods has their own uh, strength. Uh, but I happen to be a part of the home-based learning movement, and therefore, that's <laughs> <laughs> what uh, Thank you, Hank. Um, before we uh, let Hank go, um, and, and thank him again, um, we'd like to just take a few minutes. Um, so I've been asked on behalf of the uh, Pan American PBL board to just take a few minutes with Hank to recognise a colleague who, um, since we last met as a community, has passed away due to an illness. Um, Peter Boyce was uh, a valued colleague and a long time supporter of the, um, the association and before that the Pan American PBL network. He was a colleague that um, uh, was part of the original. Uh, um, Maastricht uh, team, and I'll leave Hank to perhaps just talk about um, the contribution that uh, Peter made to problem-based learning through Maastricht, and also I'll take a couple of, couple of minutes to reflect on the impact that he has made on um, the, the Pan American PBL <coughs> Association. So Hank, I'll maybe turn the time over to you to talk a little bit about Peter. Thank you. Yeah, we looked up to Peter when he joined us. We, the young, the very young staff of the Department of Education, Development and Research of Maastricht University. Before he joined us in 1975, Peter had already gained experience uh, as an educational researcher while we were absolute beginners in the field. And moreover, Peter was a man of the world for us. We were small town provincials, uh, and he came from from Amsterdam, and, uh, which which really, really uh, 
revolutionary 60s and 70s uh, was an enviable uh, feature. I even seem to remember that he wore uh, corduroy jackets and he smoked a pipe, <laughs> which for us was really the top of the top of cool. <laughs> More importantly, he had great analytical uh, skills and he could communicate his ideas, he, uh, uh, his ideas clearly and, and vividly. Um, and these qualities did not go unnoticed uh, because in 1977 he was asked to prepare the meetings of the prestigious external review committee. Uh, it will not surprise you that uh, the Schulman was also invited, but he could not come at that uh, time. But I see him point at several of the people, because what is here around the pond are the, really the who is who in medical education uh, worldwide. Um, uh, among them, uh, again, among them, uh, uh, Peter, here he is. He is uh, Dick Snow, uh, Lee. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, I Uh, 
uh, sitting around him, listening attentively. And uh, Egypt was really the beginning of Peter's international career. In the past few months, many emails from uh, colleagues I have received who, in whose life Peter made a difference. From Canada, the United States, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, Sudan, United Arab Emirates, South Africa. Maastricht University has made a name in the world uh, of education. Uh, it found uh, 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 imitation uh, worldwide. And few people know that Peter really was among those who stood at the beginning of that success. So when Peter retired, it was um, uh, an opportunity for the Pan American PBL Association, or the network at the time, to have Peter come and join us. Um, and he really brought the wisdom of um, PBL practice and research that had been done in the Netherlands and brought it to a group of somewhat novices in the area was instrumental in helping us to organize um, conferences throughout um, the Americas. Um, Peter had all the attributes of a great PBL facilitator. Uh, he was passionate and enthusiastic. He loved to work with people from all walks of life. And he was great at listening, asked sharp and insightful questions, and had an opinion on just about everything. Um, and wasn't afraid to speak the truth, but he was never overbearing, and he had a wonderful sense of humour. Um, we all miss his hearty laugh. Uh, some years ago I had the opportunity to invite him to come to Singapore um, to speak at a conference we were, a PBL conference we were hosting there. Um, he was required to walk a short distance in um, what is a very hot place. Uh, you know, Singapore, it can be 30 degrees by about 9 o'clock with 100% humidity. So he arrived at the conference dripping in sweat um, and with his face glowing red, perhaps accentuated by his brilliant white hair, he declared, it's hot. <laughs> the world is a poor place without Peter's sagacity, his wit, his passion and his friendship. We miss you, Peter. Colleagues, can you join with me in thanking Professor Hank Smith for your presentation for his presentation? starts at 10.30, so those of you who need registration you can go to Barry Hall and there's going to be obviously a crowd of people who can just follow them and go to Barry Hall. And across from Barry is Lucas Hall, where some of the other sessions will be happening. Uh, the coffee and tea will be in Barry Hall, so you can also go there for registration. Thank you and see you around.